afternoon. Welcome to People Are Talking. Well, our guest this afternoon has been called a man for all seasons. He's undoubtedly one of the great comic geniuses of our time. As an entertainer, an actor, a writer, director, producer, and certainly humanitarian, he has no equal. Would you give a nice warm welcome to Mr. Jerry Lewis? Welcome to San Francisco. Thank you. This is very nice. They gonna serve something later? <laughs> I'm looking. I don't understand. Do you have a mic on? No. We you don't need one. Overhead see? mics. Mike. Oh, just like in the film business. <laughs> when's the When's the first time you made someone laugh and knew that's what I want to do? That's for Jerry Lewis. I think uh, it had to be when my dad looked in that glass enclosure and he looked over and I went, Laddie. <laughs> True recollection would have to be my first time on stage, which is uh, 51 years ago. The first laugh was a painful one because when you don't mean for it to happen, it's a different kind of laugh. But I was going to sing Brother Can You Spare a Dime, which was the only lyric I knew. And my dad and mom were going to get a little extra for that one performance because they brought the kid along, see? I walk out on stage, and my left foot hit the footlight, and two bulbs went. The audience laughed. I felt embarrassed, and I never could get the song started. And I had a hunch that was easier than just walking out regular and singing. Mm -hmm. That could be the first laugh, I think. Now, your folks were in show business. Oh, yes. Your dad was a singer, your mom played and arranged. My dad did it all. He was the master of probably more talent. The only man I can compare my dad to would be Sammy Davis, the greatest one totally faceted entertainer I'd ever seen in my life. What was their reaction when you showed an interest in show business? Were they distressed? Because there were a lot of problems in the family. They were continually on the road. You had to stay home. You were either with them and a lot of tension. Well, they were very, very supportive, and they were very encouraging until they knew that that togetherness that we had would be divided and I would ultimately go out on the road. That's when they became more discouraging. My dad feared that I would get into all of the heavy things that happened on the road and so on. And then, of course, once things started to work for me, then he became very supportive again. But I had already drained everything I could drain, picked every brain he had of how to do. And he was my teacher, he was the master. So by that time, I was, he was seeing himself in another guise. And uh, of course, what's, what father could not feel pride in that whatever was working there, that whole creative process came from his information. He was very proud. You say they had kind of a lonely childhood. They were on the road a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, their luggage was marked anywhere. <laughs> Did they, they work the vaudeville circuit? Oh, yeah, burlesque, vaudeville, divorce circuit. All of the things that young performers today haven't the benefits of. There's nowhere for a young performer to be bad anymore. Summer stock, it used to be. Well, yeah, except um, summer stock is good. You get a tremendous... Tremendous training. The summer stock you were embraced by the book, the libretto, the music, the well-written material, and you do n you're rarely going to be in a position to individually go on your face. What we needed was the audience that looked at you like they were of a bunch of Arabs and they knew what you were. <laughs> <laughs> and until you get those Nuremberg trial audiences <laughs> when you are indeed only getting six dollars for that club day. It's painful and yet when you allude to that it will make you better. It will give you the kind of strength to turn the negative into a positive. Well, don't we all have to have a certain amount of hurt and pain in our life to make the good times really good? I don't think that we are so unique. Your audience one for one can match our pain and match all of our foibles, adversities, and everything else, except the interest isn't directed towards that audience because they are not in the light. But it's not unique. Yeah, 
have a wonderful passage in the book where you talk about pain. You were five years old. Your dad was on the road. Your mom was playing cards over at a neighbor's house, somebody else's house. And you overheard something that stuck with you, I guess, until the present time. Yeah, sure. I used to sleep on all the coats. The ladies' coats were always on whoever's place they were playing at. The bed always had coats. And I would sleep on the coats because it was cold, wintertime. And my mother helped my dad through our rough periods because she was one of the cutest little Jewish Mississippi poker players you ever saw. <laughs> and they're playing for pennies, but meanwhile, at the end of the night, in 1931, if she beat them out of seven or eight dollars, we ate for three days or four days. So I am listening to one lady saying to my mother, uh, prior to Jerry going to the other room to go to sleep, did you see what he did? My mother said, yeah, and I had been doing some monkey bit to make the ladies laugh. And she said, are you sure he doesn't need a keeper? <laughs> and my mother took objection to that because she knew what I was doing. She knew where I was coming from. That hurt me and troubled me because if that's what that point of view was from their objective examination, that frightened me even at that age would people not understand that I was using all the disguises all people use, facades, covers, the things that we all use when we are frightened and or uncertain. To this very day, we do it. Didn't you but even the, infer yeah. that I perhaps... I can talk maybe. one at a time, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. I you, can't handle this. Come, Wait a minute. <laughs> Well, what, what Anne is, is uh, going to say, I assume, is you didn't what give her the line What do you mean what Anne was going to say? Are you the interpreter now? <laughs> <laughs> I thought they alluded to the fact maybe they got the wrong baby at the hospital. That's the line you remember. No, that was coming. Ah. That was coming. <laughs> okay. The keeper line was what, what I had heard. And then, of course, that sparks other negatives. Mm -hmm. And the other one was, you sure you got the right baby at the hospital? Yeah. There was one after that. And the one after that was, maybe he's not right. <laughs> well, and if you think that doesn't hurt, I promise you it hurts. But whoever those ladies were, wherever they are this day, I pray that God gives them eternal life because I took those three remarks and I demanded of myself to turn those remarks into something they would not have understood. And I did. <clears throat> I know the first time. <laughs> You know, the first time that I uh, heard about Will Jerry... You sit he, up, Ross? <laughs> when I first heard about Jerry Lewis, as many of us uh, did, he was with another man by the name of Dean Martin. It was Martin and Lewis. And the underlying thing I got in your book is there's still a lot of hurt and pain about not only that relationship, but maybe what is going on today. We'll take a commercial break and come back and find out. A nice soft drop. A nice soft drop. I'm be alone all my life. Why did this ever happen to my friend? Mama, I'll never home again. Oh. If Proposition 13 passes, the pressure to build a peripheral canal will be even greater because California water resources will be more scarce than ever before. There'll be more pressure to get water from the Delta. Leopold and Loeb come. <laughs> We're uh, busy with Jerry Lewis this afternoon. Uh, people are talking to him. With, uh, a lot of problems, a lot of pain with that relationship of, of Martin and Lewis. Yeah, but that was a lot of love and a lot of great, wonderful moments, too. Tell us how you got together. The story of when you first went on. You can read it in the book. Oh, no. It's yeah. A, oh, but it's wonderful. You read slow. You'll see it. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, first of all, I think the smartest thing that I ever did in my life was hiring Dean. Now, <laughs> the relationship that we had was Damon and Pythias from the word go, but I have to take you back just a couple of years. 
I started as a writer. My whole lifestyle was writing. That was my big love. My first show that I had written, I was uh, at 11, had it produced by the time I was 11 and a half. And for the local community chest in Irvington, New Jersey, I used 235 in the cast because they were all kids in school. And I was prouder of that work than anything at that point in time. The thing that I attacked right after that, at the age of around 12, was a notion that I had. My dad had said there hadn't been a two-man comedy team of any consequence in show business as far back as Stan and Ollie. See, Stan and Ollie were the only two-man comedy team that were not two cops, two bakers. Laurel and Hardy. Laurel and Hardy. They were not two electricians. It was always Ollie and Stan. They might have portrayed two electricians, but the menace of Ollie against Stan's screwing things around was magic. Yet there was that missing two-man something that I ultimately titled Sex and Slapstick. I pictured a handsome leading man kind of a man and a monkey. <laughs> and I literally wrote just that which Leo Ralston later wrote for Life magazine, Sex and Slapstick Worked. So I had been writing that for two people, whoever they would be. And for four years, I had that concept. When I opened in Atlantic City doing my little dumb act, as they called it, a dumb act was an act where you just mime to recordings. And I was a record act. There was a singer on the show who had laryngitis, and the boss of the club said to me, we have to get someone else for tomorrow. You got any ideas? I said, my friend Dean Martin isn't working. Why don't we have him come in? He said, no, I don't want another singer. I said, yeah, but he does a lot of funny stuff with me. And when he's singing, and it's not just a singer, you'll be getting extra stuff. And I'm selling, man, because I'm in Atlantic City alone, and I'm lonely, and I had audiences of almost one. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted some company. They brought Dean in the next night, make a long story short. He did his three songs. I did my little record act, and the show was over. The owner of the club's partner came to see me. Hey, Jerry, <laughs> remember what you told Eddie about the funny things you guys do? <laughs> if you don't do it in the next show, you both are going to be working on your ankles. <laughs> I grabbed Dean, we went upstairs to our dressing room, which was a nail. <laughs> and I said, look at what I've been working on. And he looks and he's reading. And I was writing on an Underwood typewriter that I had rented in Atlantic City for $8 a week at the time, which left me take home pay of $61 a week. That's where we were at, okay? His income for that engagement, I think, was $65 a week. I said, Dean, we need the $65 a week for you and for me. I got a car payment, and I didn't have a car. <laughs> <laughs> I said, if we approach this, at least with this first notion that I had written, which was a mime piece against someone who was doing something else, it, within a matter of an hour and a half, he nailed in his head where I was coming from. Remember, I had been writing it for four years. He walked on that stage at midnight, and we did four and a half solid hours together, relating to practically nothing that I had written, but he kept in the back of his mind the concept, the good-looking guy and the monkey. And I did every visual thing I could imagine. His interplay and his magic, his innate sense of comic timing was so stunning Remember, I had my dad to think about. The research told me he was not only stunning, but he was possibly the greatest delineator of everything that looked like a straight man while bringing to it the kind of gem-like approach to humor like I've never seen. I was working with him while I was in awe, forgetting that he was handsome and all the ladies liked him and all they wanted to do was burp me and I had all those things going. <laughs> And we were pulling 130 bucks a week together doing that. Within three nights, Atlantic City, which is a word-to-mouth place, heard what was happening. And that four and a half hours, mind you, was played to four people in that audience. Two were drunk, and two wondered why they were there. <laughs> in three days, that room that sat about 300 people had 5,000 people circling that nightclub 
and in less than 24 weeks, we were getting $50,000 a week. In less than six months' time, it was so quick, so meteoric, it was so frightening, yet I don't recall any of the fright or the meteoric or any of that because what I say in the book was I wasn't looking at Dean and I and we had a good thing going and the answer to the dreams were coming true. I was looking at my creative process was working and for a writer to do something that works, the satisfaction sometimes far exceeds a performance with standing ovations. I was looking at my baby working because I could take myself out of myself and look from here to see those two men are doing what I created. So that's where my head was at. Never realizing that it was gonna be Jerry this, Jerry that, Jerry the creator, Jerry the businessman, Dean plays golf, and Dean had taken nine years of that. The opening night at the Copa, they said Jerry Lewis is a master of mime and insanity, and he is indeed a monkey, and he's off the wall. The straight man was wonderful, and they never mentioned his name in that review. For nine years, I didn't know that was happening because I was involved in constantly driving that creative process and giving it more warmth, giving it more energy, writing another visual. So I wasn't seeing what, where he was coming from, except we loved one another. If it, tables were turned, that team could not have lasted three weeks because I couldn't have dealt with that. I am a very honest man. If I do something, I want the credit, and I want it now. If I didn't do it, give it to whoever earns it. I'm not envious of that. But if it's mine, you can't have it. I worked very hard to get it. An audience doesn't look at a credit on a motion picture. I do, and it means a great deal to me. So that's where I was coming from. He finally had it, but I was the one that broke the team up. Exactly 10 years to the day. To the day. Exactly. I, we closed I, at the Copa <clears throat> to the day. On the, it's a wonderful story. i got to interrupt you right now for a commercial break. Let's Anything to it. make dollars, yeah. is that yeah. it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. almighty dollar. Yeah. 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 hear about that yeah. just a minute. we're going to reintroduce you here because we're having a great time this afternoon talking to jerry lewis and we we're talking about his very close relationship with dean martin 10 years to the day mm -hmm. of your first performance you had your last performance last performance at the copa which was 56 july 25th 1956 and then for 20 solid years we hadn't seen one another until 76 when Frank surprised me on the air with Were you really that surprised with, with Dean Martin walking on the telethon? Look at the film, look at the tape. What did you say to him when you saw him? You were almost speechless, I right? didn't, I, I know that when I saw him, my heart was full, but I did remember thinking, dear God, give me something to say. And I am rarely without something to say. <laughs> when he came close to me and I, we put our arms around one another, the line flashed in my head to say to him, <coughs> You working? <laughs> that laugh from that audience broke whatever uncertainties I had. And it was a marvelous night. Have but you seen him since? No. I guess it'll have to be another 20 years. 96. Do you know any reason for that? Have you yes. ever been given reason for that? Yeah, he made it very clear. He's very private. Dean is like that. More so now than ever. I was the only one that could ever get close to him. Now, if he's doing that to me, he has his reasons, and I respect it. If it were 25 years ago, the rejection for me would be I'd, be, I'd be living in a rubber room. I really understand where he's coming from, and I respect that. But his magic was that he did comedy more often than I did, and that audience never saw that. I played more straight for Dean's comedy, and no one ever knew when that turn was happening. I can't take credit for that creative process. I did know after I saw what he had, then uh, my writings were such that the turns were created, and he did it to a fair they were. Willie. I'm yeah. Jerry. What Willie? Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, some years ago, you began a group of theaters throughout the country that yes. were oriented for family viewing. I wondered, are any of them still in existence? No, I don't believe so. There may be a couple that, that I've allowed to retain the name, but... Uh, I shouldn't have done that because I'm told that 
they're running whatever they want to run. But it was a marvelous beginning, a great chance for what I wanted, which was family entertainment. But it bellied up because some people really didn't recognize the problems at hand. Stephen, you had a question. Jerry, I wanted to ask you how your kids are doing against the fight against muscular dystrophy. This is probably the only time in my uh, 33 years that I'm going to put that question on the back burner, my friend. And let me explain. Before you do a show like this, the lovely guests, the hosts, the marvelous production crew will always come to an artist and say, is there anything you don't want to talk about? I don't happen to believe in that. If you don't want to talk about something, don't come here, OK? I don't say to them I don't want to discuss that. I want it asked so that I can openly on the air give you the answer. It's the only time in more than 33 years that I would choose to put my kids on the back burner simply because I have never been out among my friends in this country as I am this time. I've always been out there prepared to discuss everything and anything because there was no conflict of interest. I've written a book. The purpose for that is to make a lot of money. It's a profit-making venture that brings me here. The day that I can come back here, if I'm invited back, I will discuss my kids, the association, and the pride and all of that good stuff that comes from here about that when there are no profits involved, okay? Just so there's no confusion. It's just so there is never, I never crisscross the two issues. A lot of tension between you and, uh, and your dad in the early 70s. He, the family finally moved to California. The furniture moved to California. <laughs> he well, says, I want to go to California. So I packed up all his furniture with two huge 18-wheeler trucks they arrive in Los Angeles, they look around, they're not that crazy about it. Ten days later, all of their furniture arrives, and Dad says, we want to go back to New York. I said, well, at least your furniture saw California. <laughs> How about giving him the, tell the story about uh, giving him the car, the Cadillac, and you drive for a birthday. Well, he had never driven in his life, and he was about 39 or 40, 40, let me think, I was 20, he had to be 45. And I was worried about his driving, frightened that somebody would hurt him. So I called A.L. Roach, who was a very dear friend of mine, with the Cadillac division of General Motors. I said, I need to build a patent tank that looks like a Cadillac four-door sedan. <laughs> I explained why. I said, if my dad is hit or hurt, I need to know that he's not going to be hurt badly. And they literally built me a bulletproof 1928-type automobile. The normal car at that time would have cost seven or eight thousand dollars i paid thirty seven thousand dollars to build this bulletproof steel cadillac car the kind of a car that we uh, would seriously attempt running two 18 wheelers into it and the 18 wheelers would bounce off so i was secure i brought it to my dad's home when they delivered it, and i put ribbons all over it and i said pop happy birthday there's your birthday present and he looked at it and he said it's not a convertible. <laughs> that to me was funny while I said, why didn't I get what he wanted? But that would be dangerous. See? But at that, now I can talk to you about it. At that time, it hurt me that he didn't recognize what I had done. Well, how could he? He didn't know. But he had a, such a fantastic sense of humor. There were nine out of ten times when I wasn't sure where he was coming from. We got another commercial break. Be right back. What happened to the Cadillac? <laughs> this is Jerry Lewis's book, Jerry Lewis in person. And you can meet Jerry Lewis today at Macy's in San Francisco what with the bookseller, uh, Jerry Lewis in person. Son of a gun. Yeah, one o'clock today, he'll be there, and you can uh, see him in person. You know what? We, we don't do this very often. Would you, let's just keep going. Will you come back Monday? We'll just plug in another part two, Jerry Lewis? What's the matter with Tuesday? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. Sure, I'll come back. Terrific. Okay. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday in the afternoon once again with Jerry Lewis. And I'll be right <laughs> Wardrobe is furnished from Livingston's by Elder Coscott. The Hyatt on Union Square has furnished rooms for guests if people are talking in return for this announcement.
America's favorite Tootsie <laughs> is on a roll. Murder? Yeah, murder. Ah. It's Bette Midler. And you know what you get at the end of the ride? Yeah, 20 years of life. From the divine <laughs> to the ridiculous. We did it! We jinxed a black cat comedy about the perfect crime. Rated R. Now playing at a theater near you. Check newspaper for theater and showtime. An architect. One of the kings of comedy paid a visit to San Francisco today. And